Introduction In the words of Edward Sapper, gestures are an elaborate and secret code that is written nowhere, known to none, and understood by all. It is extraordinary that humans have such a complicated underlying communication system parallel with verbal speech that is so taken for granted. The study of speech production must not be limited to verbal production, after all, speech as a whole includes lexical, emotional, semantic, phonological, syntactic, and motoric gestural aspects. This non-verbal expression or gestural communication is largely unconscious, but makes up an important aspect of language production. Are gesture and language really so interconnected? The evidence strongly points toward yes, though we may not notice our own actions, gesture appears to serve many functions, including more efficient and better communication of meaning, facilitated speech production and assisted language education. Even from a young age gesture is integral to language formation and its production. Clearly, the relationship between gesture and spoken language is more reciprocal and significant than one might intuitively think. Iconic these gestures are recognized as hand signals that convey meaning in both physical form and manner that co-occur with verbal meaning. Example? In this photo the man is describing a camera lens verbally while simultaneously representing the size and shape of the lens with his hand. Metaphoric metaphorics or metaphorical gestures are true to their name in that they are hand symbols that represent abstract ideas that are impossible to represent directly. Example? A fist motion upwards and twisted to the left may stand for the idea of freedom. Beat unlike iconic gestures, beats are hand movements that emphasize the spoken discourse itself, the function of speech, and convey minimal or no extra information. Example? Up and down or back and forth hand movements that coincide with spoken clauses, breaks, or sentence ends. Dictic these are limited to pointing gestures that occur at the beginning of conversation or at the beginning of a new topic to reference a real or imagined target. Example? Someone may point off into the distance to reference a place or time. Cohesive these gestures incorporate iconics as a way to physically connect different parts of a narrative. Example? To connect a previous statement with a current one, someone may flick the hand backwards from the lap towards the ear. Emblem emblems have direct meaning of their own and require no linguistic reinforcement. Typically they do not co-occur with speech as other gesture types do. Emblems tend to be culture-specific, whereas co-speech gestures have interesting similarities across cultures. Example? In North America the thumbs-up gesture is usually interpreted as good or ready. In many cultures, however, it is considered an obscene gesture. Roles of gesture in speech production information communication. There are two main hypotheses of what role gesture plays in speech, one of which is to aid in the communication of meaning or information and to allow the transfer of supplementary information other than that presented in linguistic output. For example, when verbally describing how large a structure is, a person may also concurrently make hand motions that detail the shape. This hypothesis is also known as the Mutually Adaptive Modalities Hypothesis, or MAM. Research suggests that gesturing is beneficial for communication. When one is faced with ambiguity in speech, possibly due to background noise, incomprehensible requests, or unintelligible speech, a listener tends to rely on gestural input to provide extra information. In cases of when speech is comprehensible, studies have shown that participants still exhibit a more accurate understanding of instructions or narratives when speech is paired with gestures. Wu and Colson, 2007 found that when participants were shown pictures congruent with both speech and gesture, smaller N300 and N400 event-related potentials were elicited than when the pictures were only congruent with speech. In other words, pictures were easier to understand when gestures were combined with speech. This indicates that, corresponding with previous research, co-speech gestures allow for the better interpretation of spoken meaning. In addition, co-speech gesture has been shown to facilitate the learning of new words in a foreign language, and young children may be able to understand the meaning of novel verbs when presented with gestural information and no speech. So it appears that gesture could not only relieve speech ambiguity and supply additional meaning, but it could also aid in the understanding of novel words in both familiar and foreign languages. Lexical access The second hypothesis of why we use gesture is to facilitate lexical access, or in different terms, to aid working memory and word retrieval during speech. When we speak of gesture-assisted speech it becomes necessary to mention lexical affiliates, these are defined as the word a specific gesture is hypothesized to facilitate. The reasoning behind the lexical access premise comes from studies that have found a link between cognitive tasks and motor movements. For instance, when told to imagine the shape of an inverted S, one may furrow their brow, change their gaze, and gesticulate. 
Physical movement has also been found to occur during mental arithmetic, the consideration of visual presentations, and during the course of memory processes. With this connection in mind, further research has demonstrated that motor movements may perform a supporting function for a few cognitive tasks. During the course of speech, it is well documented that gesturing occurs, and knowing that speech is a cognitive process, it stands to reason that there is another motive for co-speech gesture than just information communication, gesture may also assist lexical access. Krauss, 1998, proposed that because human memory represents knowledge using many different dimensions, e.g. visuospatial and motoric, and the same memory may be stored in multiple domains, gesticulation, which reflects spatiodynamic features, may aid in the activation of other memory formats, therefore assisting the lexical access. Wesp, Hess, and Kutman, 2001, also suggested that gestures help to maintain spatial representations in working memory. They found that when participants were asked to describe a painting from memory, they tended to gesture almost twice as much compared to when describing a painting in their immediate environment. In another study, this was further supported when participants exhibited more muscular activity in their dominant arm during memory retrieval of concrete and spatial words, i.e. those that can be more expressed in visual format. A study by Morrill Samuels and Krauss, 1992, indicates that gestures occur extremely near to their lexical affiliates, and a gesture's duration is closely related to how long it takes a speaker to retrieve a word. Conjointly, it appears that more lexical gestures occur during spontaneous compared to rehearsed speech, indicating that gestures may be more prevalent in more hesitant speakers and are performed to facilitate word retrieval. Continuing this line of research, Rosher, Krauss, and Chen, 1996, showed that when gesture was constrained, participants spoke more slowly, but only when the content of speech was spatial in nature, this supports the idea that gestures may maintain spatial representations and assist in memory retrieval. These results have been further supported by Pine, Bird, and Kirk, 2007, when they found that, during a naming task, children could name more words correctly and complete more tip-of-the-tongue tasks when allowed to gesture than when their movements were restricted. Altogether, this research supports the lexical access hypothesis and suggests that gestures are also important for speech production as well as information communication. These two hypotheses have the most support and evidence, but a few newer ideas include that gesture may work to decrease cognitive load during language processing and aid conceptual processes before speech. It is possible that gesture fills all of these roles, contributing in an important yet subtle way to spoken language. Relationship of gesture with speech neuropsychological evidence, we know that gesture most likely serves a function of assisting lexical retrieval and or communicating information, but speech also has other inherent connections with gesture. According to the evidence, one of the primary roles of gesture is lexical retrieval, so it would follow that those with neuropsychological damage would have this word access affected. Correspondingly, research on stroke patients has provided evidence that those with anomic aphasia, deficits in word naming and retrieval abilities with normal comprehension, exhibit more gestures during an aeration than typical patients or those with visuospatial deficits. In addition, those with Wernicke's aphasia, deficits in comprehension with satisfactory levels of object naming and repetition, do not gesture as much as those with anomia or conduction aphasia, deficits in object naming and repetition with all right comprehension. Rose and Douglas, 2001, conducted a study in which they had patients with aphasia participate in a naming task when instructed to point, visualize, and gesture, those with phonological access, storage, or encoding difficulties displayed significant improvement with iconic gesture. This research indicates that an underlying neurological connection between speech and gesture may be at work, and gestures may aid in the recovery of patients with aphasia due to their ability to promote lexical access. Development gesture and spoken language appear to be highly interrelated in the brain, and this translates to the importance of gestural role in adult speech, but gesture also plays a central role during language development. Gestures usually begin early, before speech, and are accordingly referred to as prelinguistic gestures. Most infants begin gesturing between 6 and 10 months of age as a critical communication method. Another important step in language is learning the appropriate response to parental gestures, and this occurs around 9 and 12 months of age. Zamet and Schaefer, 2010, found that the use of iconic gestures by mothers, controlling for maternal labeling and volubility, reliably predicted noun acquisition and comprehension. This indicates that joint attention between parents and infants serves to facilitate language acquisition. It appears that because gestures are synchronized with speech, it aids infants in deducing the meaning behind spoken words. Up until verbal communication takes over, 
Infants too use their own individual gestures to facilitate communication with parents. As children grow older, gestures remain but take on a more subtle role. Gestures used by infants and children are referred to as deictic, pointing, references gestures, and representational, both referential and semantic content, e.g. waving goodbye or opening and closing the hand to refer to a fish. Coletta, Pelink, and Ligadetti, 2010, found a strong correlation between age, narrative complexity, and gesture use. This supports the hypothesis that as we age not only does our linguistic discourse grow more complex, but our co-speech gestures develop as well, from only deictic and representational to more complex gesticulation, in the context of narrative and social activity. The link between cognition, language, and gestures is further expanded by other investigators, including Fenson and Ramsey, 1980, who found that along with the first two word combinations, two or more gestures combined into one functional movement occur near the same time during Piaget's final stage of sensorimeter intelligence, around 20 months of age. Furthermore, significant correlations have been found between multi-word speech and multi-combinational gestures. This indicates that as speech progresses through development, so does gesticulation in a similar fashion. So, gestures appear to be necessary in the development of language through parental input and social interaction, and as speech develops and becomes more complex throughout life, so does gesture. Gesture-inclusive models Comprehensive models of speech production incorporate speaking with co-speech gestures in an attempt to understand language, here are the three main models. The McNeil Integrated Model In the McNeil Integrated Model, it has been proposed that gestures share a computational or comprehension stage with speech, thereby developing simultaneously as a part of the same underlying psychological processes to respond to external agents concurrently. This psychological source of a synchronous verbal gestural unit is called a growth point. Additionally, because they occur together, gestures and speech most likely have the same or similar semantic information to communicate, this is especially true for iconic gestures. The focus is placed on iconic gestures because they are visuospatial in nature, and the integration model concentrates on spatial information. This hypothesis would predict that when communicating in a noisy room, and when spatial information is being communicated over the phone, more gestures, mostly iconic with the phone, would be used. McNeil, 1985, illustrated his model by comparing the gestures and speech of five different people on describing a narrative involving a character entering and climbing up inside a drainpipe. On inspection, not only was the recorded spoken language similar, but so were the iconic gestures. He tries going up inside of the drainpipe while the hand rises and points upward. He tries climbing up in the drainspout of the building while the hand rises and starts to point up. And he goes up through the pipe this time while the hand rises and the fingers form a basket. This time he tries to go up inside the rain gutter while the hand points and rises quickly. As he tries climbing up the rain barrel while the hand flexes back and then upwards. As these examples demonstrate, gestures occurred at the same point as speech and described the same semantic information, spatial in nature. Furthermore, complex multi-combinational gestures tend to have pauses between semantic units which correspond with speech. This indicates that gestures mirror speech, and it is especially poignant since gestures, like language, are similar between speakers. In this model, there are slight changes in meaning during co-speech gestures, and taken together with concurrent spoken word, a single complex meaning is derived from a lone cognitive growth point. An implication of this model is that imagistic thinking, aided through gesture, plays a central role as speech and its conceptualization. The sketch model The sketch model is a processing model for gesture and speech, developed by Jan Peter de Ruiter, 2006. It is based on the gesture-inclusive McNeil model of language, in that it incorporates the idea of simultaneous growth points, here referred to as a conceptualization stage, and the hypothesis of shared semantic information into a more specific representation. This model attempts to account for evidence for growth points provided by McNeil by proposing a single cognitive conceptualizer that synchronizes gesture with speech plans and subsequently leads to overt production of both at once. The Krauss autonomous model The Krauss model differs from the previous ones in that it sees gesture and speech as non-integrated. In this way, gestures may serve to communicate some meaning, but their primary role is to facilitate lexical retrieval. So this model focuses on the lexical access's role of gestures, while the McNeil and Sketch models focus on the information communication role. The Krauss and McNeil models are similar in that they both assume gestures occur very close to their lexical affiliates and may share a common origin at some point. In addition, they both concentrate on the idea that gestures more so reflect spatiodynamic or visuospatial features of speech. 
Contrarily, this model assumes that there is no shared semantic conceptualization stage. This is based on evidence from tip of the tongue, taught tasks like that of Frick Horbury and Gatentag, 1998. This study restricted the participant ability to gesture during taught tasks and found that preventing gesticulation interfered with word retrieval. This has been further supported by others such as Pine, Bird, and Kirk, 2007. Retrieval failures in these taught tasks were mostly phonological, so it was inferred that not only do gestures and speech not share a conceptualization stage, gestures must reflect phonological more than semantic encoding. It was concluded that instead of gesture and speech being related at a semantic level during a conceptualization stage, it is much more likely that the influence of gestures on speech is with their ability to aid word retrieval in a spatiodynamic fashion during phonological encoding. So in that way, speech and gesture diverge and run parallel to each other from the same point in working memory to meet at the overt production point. Some gestures may be intended for information communication purposes, such as emblematics, but most are solely produced for lexical retrieval. Conclusion Finally, research into language must include gesticulation in its repertoire. As one studies the role of gesticulation in speech, it becomes more and more apparent of just how important it really is. Gesture serves to help the development of language in children, aid communication of information, facilitate lexical access and possibly much more. In this, gesture acts in a subtle yet complex manner to reinforce human communication and bring us closer together.